Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is our second lesson from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Before the sermon, I'll just reread the last verse of our text where Paul writes, For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. So far, our text. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, dear Christian friends. So imagine a... a fifth grade boy living around here who's looking forward to his birthday. And as the birthday approaches, his parents ask him, well, well, what would you like for your birthday? And like many fifth grade boys around here, he says, I would like a Packers jersey for my birthday. Oh, great. Well, what Packers jersey would we, which should we get you? He thinks and says, well, I would like the quarterback's jersey. Well, very good. So there on his birthday, there is a package, and he opens up the package, and of course inside the package is a green jersey with number 12 on it. Rogers is the name. And he looks at it, though, and he's got somewhat of a downcast expression on his face. They ask, well, what's wrong? Well, that, that wasn't the Packers quarterback I wanted. Oh, well, okay. We can go and we can exchange that. There are a few number four jerseys available yet. We will get you that. No, no, that's not the one I want either, he says. And they're thinking, well, is, is our boy an old school Packer fan or what? We'll get you a number 15 Bart Starr jersey then. No, that's not the one I want either. And the parents can't figure it out. They're not going to go all the way back to Arnie Herber, they don't think. And finally, the, the, the boy says, I want number 17. I want a David Whitehurst jersey. And mom and dad look at each other and think, why? You could wear Aaron Rodgers' jersey. You could wear Brett Favre's jersey. You could wear Bart Starr's jersey. Why would you want to wear David Whitehurst's jersey? Not to beg on David Whitehurst. I mean, he wasn't the best quarterback in the world, but he was good enough to play for eight years in the NFL. But still, David Whitehurst? The boy simply says, that's who I want. Okay, if that's what's going to make him happy, mom and dad are going to go out and get him a custom number 17 Green Bay David Whitehurst jersey. Probably be the only one in town. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but that's what he wanted. It's kind of how God feels about you and me, though, isn't it? There are so many people in this world. There are 7 billion people in this world. And of those 7 billion, how many can truly say they're going to be saved by Jesus Christ? You and I can. And not, not because of anything we've done either, but because God in his love and mercy has come to us. Why? Why us? We know that it's not... Something inside of us that has made God love us. In fact, we know that we are going to go to heaven despite the fact there are many people out there who lead better outward lives than we do, and they're not going to go to heaven. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and yet this is God's love for us. Senseless love. In a world that wants to make everything make sense, we have to admit there are some things that just don't make sense. They never will make sense to us, and that's a good thing. Your strength is God's senseless love. Paul's writing to the Corinthians in our text, a congregation that he helped start, and a congregation that was mixed up, uh, mixed of practically equal parts Jewish believers and Gentile, non-Jewish believers. Greeks. And Paul freely admits that the message that he preaches is regarded by most people who hear it as foolishness. We've talked about it before. How, why is it that you are never going to be able to argue your unbelieving friends and family members into believing what you believe? Simply because what you believe doesn't really make any sense on its face. That God loved you enough to send his son down to earth to die for you. 
And it didn't make sense to many of the people who heard the Apostle Paul preach either. He refers to some of the opposition that some of the people in the, in the Corinthian congregation would have brought into the congregation as part of their personal bias growing up. Jews demand miraculous signs, Paul says. Greeks look for wisdom. Jewish people could have looked back in their history and seen all sorts of miracles that God performed, from the parting of the Red Sea to escape the Egyptian army, to the miracles that Elisha and Elijah performed to prove that they were prophets sent from God. They could see a God who intervened in their nation's history and performed miracles. So it's no wonder that when Jesus was conducting his ministry among Jewish people, many times they would seemingly interrupt him in the middle of what he was saying and, and say, but can you show us a sign? Can you do something miraculous? That's the way that we'll know that you actually are who you say you are. And according to his love and mercy, Jesus sometimes would condescend to perform a miracle to show that he was who he said he was. But now by the time Paul's writing, the age of miracles has pretty much ended. Every now and then you we have a report of one of the apostles given the ability to perform a miracle, but those instances are very few and far between in the New Testament. And Paul says his ministry is not a ministry of walking around performing miracles. His ministry is a ministry of preaching. And he preaches Christ. Not Christ the miracle worker, but Christ crucified. His message is not all the miracles that Jesus performed. His message is Jesus died on the cross for you. And to many people that just isn't appealing. The Jewish people want to hear about miracles. The Greek people want to hear something philosophical. The Greeks invented philosophy. Literally, it means the love of wisdom. You think back in Greek history to, to Aristotle, to Plato, to Socrates. These were guys who, along with their followers, loved getting the gears in their head turning so quickly that they could think in ways that people had never thought before and then be so proud of themselves that they could think such high, lofty thoughts. And the Greeks wanted a message that would challenge them intellectually and make them think, well, well, there is enough in Scripture to challenge us intellectually, if you're patient enough to get to it. But we have to admit, the basic message of Christianity is very, very simple. Jesus Christ died to pay for your sins. And that wasn't what the Greek people wanted to hear either. It's too simple, too easy. There has to be more to it. And besides that, Greek mythology was all about creating gods that were Act, people that were beings that acted like humans but were much, much bigger and much, much more powerful than humans. And the message of Jesus is that God came down to earth in human flesh. And that wasn't what they wanted to hear either. The problem was that people weren't willing to accept God on his terms. They wanted to invent something that was a little more interesting a little more fitting of the way that they thought. People still do it today, too. One of the best-selling books of the last 10 years has been a book called The Secret. Have you heard of the book The Secret? Do you own the book The Secret? Oprah highly recommended it, which in and of itself should tell you you should run away from it, but <laughs> very highly recommended it. And the, the message of the secret is there's, there's nothing that you can't have if you don't, as long as you just think hard about it. Positive thinking is going to bring you whatever you want in life. The law of attraction means that whatever you think about the most is just naturally going to be drawn to you, whether that's a material object, whether that's a person, whether that's health, whether that's good living habits. Just think about it, and they'll eventually become yours, and if they aren't yours, you're just not thinking enough about it. 
And how many people struggling with their weight, struggling with addiction, struggling with their personal relationships have gone out and wasted money on this book and haven't had anything change in their lives because the problem wasn't that they weren't thinking about it. They were thinking about it. If you get a diagnosis of cancer, you're not going to run out and buy a pack of Band-Aids and think you're going to solve your cancer by applying Band-Aids to yourself. The Apostle Paul says that the message of the cross is foolishness, but only to those who are perishing. The problem with the people who are perishing is they don't see the wisdom in the message of the cross. It's there. The message of the cross gets to the root cause of every human problem. Disobedience toward God. Sin. The cross is all about sin. How was it that Jesus came to be nailed to the cross in the first place? Through human sin. His enemies hated him. They lied about him. Those who ought, to have been, who ought to have protected him in government were too scared to do so. And so the only innocent man ever to walk on earth, the only one who had never done anything wrong, was punished as if he were the worst criminal who ever lived. And that happened by God's design. So that you and I would never have to suffer in that way. Not, not physically, but, but spiritually. Because as we've said before, the, the, the true pain of the cross wasn't the hanging aspect of being pitched forward or the nails driven through the hands and feet. It was the abandonment of the Heavenly Father toward Jesus, making Jesus cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You and I aren't going to have to cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because we are never going to be forsaken by our God. The cross tells us not just that God punishes sin, but that he forgives sin. Jesus died for us. That's our strength. That's our strength to get through each and every day. That's our strength when we look ahead to the future. We have a God who so loved us that he was willing to give up his only son for us. We have a God that so loved us that he, in the person of that son, was willing to go through whatever he had to go through in order for us to be saved. And we have a God that so loves us that he's going to keep every single promise to us that he's made, including his promise to take those difficulties that we have in our life and turn them around and make them somehow blessings for us. Your strength is the senseless love of God. That he should love you, that he should love me, enough to do all of that for us. Many of you have heard me preach enough to have some sort of opinion as to the way I preach and the sermons that I construct. And I wonder if some of you think that my sermons are just a little bit repetitive. That in the end, all of them kind of sound at least a little bit alike. Well, I hope so. Look at the Apostle Paul in our text. He preached Christ crucified, and I pray that I always do too. Whatever else is going on in the world that we can refer to during the sermon, whatever is happening in our earthly lives that we're struggling with that we could refer to in a sermon, in the end, it has to come around to the one place where we can actually get comfort, the one place where we can actually get hope for the future, the cross of Christ. So yes, Satan will whisper in my ear when I'm preparing a sermon, Hey, Schmidt, you better come up with something interesting this week. You've got to get something new in there that they're going to listen to this time around. Not that anyone ever wants to be boring, but 
It has to be about Jesus. And most specifically, it has to be about the cross of Jesus. That's where we see the senseless love of God. Loving us so much that he would give up his own son for us. That's where we see the love of Jesus for us, enduring all things so that we would not have to endure that same pain. That's where we see our strength to endure in this day and age. When we see the one who carried his own cross, also willing to carry our crosses alongside us. And that's where we see real hope for the future where we know that because our Savior bled and died for us, we have a perfect place waiting for us in heaven. Some of us are smarter than others, and we can get those wheels turning a little faster. Some of us are physically stronger than others, and we can do things physically that others can't do. But even if we're weak, frail, even if our minds start to deteriorate, our strength is always in the same place. And our strength is stronger than anything that any human being can devise. Our strength is the senseless love of God. Amen. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.